uh, naturalization was still racially restricted. That is, not everyone could become a citizen. Most famously, wow. uh, Asian uh, immigrants could not become citizens. Indian immigrants from the country of India could not become citizens. So it's a famous set of Supreme Professor Gulasekhar, what roles did our states play in legislating and enforcing immigration? And perhaps I'm using the wrong words here, legislating, quote unquote, and enforcing. I just want to know, were they involved since the founding of our nation? Yeah. So one of the things that's quite remarkable about when you look back at the history of state and localities and their um, relationship to immigration is that when you look at the first 100 years of the republic, Mm -hmm. the federal government actually did very little regulation of immigration and certainly not in the ways that we understand it today. Um, which meant that what we mostly might think of as immigration regulation was done at the state and local level. Now, this was not uniform throughout the existing states at that time, but if you do a survey, and, and it is not certainly not my work, but other notable scholars, uh, including Gerald Newman, who's at Harvard Law School right now, has written about this. Uh, but if you look back at that first century of the republic's existence, what you'll see is a lot of state and local laws that controlled, for example, uh, the regulation of convicts coming into a locality, the regulation of people who might be too poor or were likely to become, as, as the um, legal term is used, likely to become a public charge. That is, they were likely to yeah. uh, use public benefits. There was there were laws that regulated uh, the the uh, the movement of people because they were going to spread contagious diseases or required quarantine of people. Sounds like Title Forty Two. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah. Those, those are the the pro you know the the first laws that eventually became the authority that that we now see in things like Title Forty Two. Um, and then, of course, during that first century, uh, right before the Civil War, uh, regional regulations that relating to slavery and the movement of free blacks uh, across the United States and, of, of course, fugitive slaves that across borders. Um, in many ways, this these were the regulations that one might argue uh, constituted the immigration laws of the first century of the republic's existence. It's only after the Civil War into the 1870s and 1880s that the federal government starts to regulate immigration in the ways that we under, would understand it today. So let's go back here. I have a couple of, I guess, burning questions. Mm -hmm. First, you said that the federal government did very little in the way of what today we would think of as regulating immigration. Um, is this because re immigration wasn't a big deal in the first hundred years of our republic before the Civil War? So there's certainly lots of different inputs and explanations. One was one was that there was a general policy of wanting more people to populate the United States, at least from certain areas, specifically northern and western Europe, or places that were familiar to the the people already in the United States to help with the expansion uh, of the United States. Uh, the federal government, though, at that time. Um, the other explanation that is often given by historians is that federal regulation of immigration was seen to be too close to allowing general federal regulation of the slave trade in general. And therefore, while oh. slavery existed, uh, some uh, many historians have argued it was not politically feasible for the federal government to enter into immigration regulation. This is why some would argue that the real that the real first in federal immigration laws, the first comprehensive federal regulation of admission um, into the United States, occurs in 1875 after the Civil War, after the Reconstruction Amendments, when slavery is now no longer on the table. Even though a, a potential federal regulation before the Civil War may not have been regarding slavery, it was just too close to that topic for Southern states to be comfortable with it. I think that is that is certainly one of the <laughs> uh, more persuasive um, explanations proffered in the academic literature. 
wow, that's fascinating. I would have never thought that. I th- I don't think it's something that intuitively comes across when you read history or when you look back at U.S. immigration history. My second, quote unquote, burning question that I have for you, after you explain the first hundred years of our immigration history, is this. You know, different state level laws or regulations, local ordinances or what have you relating to immigration, right? Let's take that back to my personal experience as a lawyer, patent law. You can't have 50 patent laws in our 50 states. Like you have a patent in Arizona, but not in New Jersey. How does that even make sense, right? So how did this make sense? You can't have, well, back then there were in 50 states up to 1870, whatever. They eventually grew to 20 some states. Um, How could you have different immigration regulation for New York versus Virginia? So I guess... I don't know, French Huguenots could come to North Carolina, South Carolina, but not to New York. And then how did that work? Yeah, it's it's certainly um, not a, a way of thinking about immigration uh, and a state of affairs that is easy to imagine today. Yeah, yeah. It's very foreign to the way we understand immigration. And as you said, sort of the practical necessity, maybe, of a uniform set of rules with regards to migra- to both entry and then the terms and condition of staying and then exit. That said, that is fundamentally what uh, the what it looked like uh, prior yeah. to 1870. Um, there were, for example, there were there was Supreme Court case uh, that upheld a New York law that required certain information from passengers landing in New York. This is an 1837 case, and the Supreme Court said it's okay for the state of New York to demand certain information from passengers landing at New York Harbor. Um, Such as? Uh, so they at that point, they were looking for uh, information as to whether the passengers would be dangerous. Um, but the broader law that was at issue in this case, it's called New York versus Milne. It's an 1837 Supreme Court case. Uh, the broader law was a state law that attempted to regulate whether passengers disembarking in New York were going to be, for example, paupers, that is too poor to land, yeah. really had certain diseases, et cetera. Um, and these were not uniform uh, throughout all of the landing ports in the United States. So it's entirely uh, plausible that somebody could land at one port and be su- subject to certain regulations and land at another port and, and be subject to maybe similar, but not necessarily the same regulations, right? So this was, um, so you're right, this was not a situation where one could possibly say that there was a uniform set of regulations that a a non-citizen or a person coming from a foreign land would face when they came to the United States. Um, And obviously this is saying nothing about the the land borders of the United States at that time, um, to the extent they existed, uh, where people could cross into territory that would later be become the United States, but at that time may not have been the United States. Oh, like private lands that they could uh, traverse over to get into federal uh, sort of territory or states, America, right? Is that what you're referring to? Into into the territory that would become Mm -hmm. the United States, right? And so, um, yes, you're right. There there was no real uniformity um, prior to the federal, the emergence of a robust federal system of regulation in the in the 1870s 1880s into the 1890s um even so even during that time of even during that time of transition a, a lot of the the federal bureaucracy was dependent on the state systems the state controls over ports uh over disembarkation points and then it was only by the late 19th century that the federal bureaucracy over immigration uh, became more robust in the ways that we'd be that would be more familiar to us today um i, I just i want to ask a technical question that may be telling uh, about some of the details uh, out of what you were just describing. So how did an immigrant become a citizen? Let's say, you know, you land in South Carolina, it's 18, whatever, 45. Was there a different set of criteria for becoming a U.S. citizen than, let's say, if you landed in New Hampshire? Or was there a federal sort of, was there a CFR for this or something to that effect, you know? So the one thing that Congress did uh, enact from the very beginning of the Republic 
were using its naturalization power, that is the power given to Congress. In Which Austin, was in the Constitution. That is in the Constitution. Yeah, Congress yeah. did use the naturalization power and had always had, ever since the beginning of the Republic, laws that regulated the conditions under which uh, somebody who was foreign born could become a citizen of the United States. Now, not surprisingly, uh, at the beginning of the Republic, through the through the Civil War, and even afterwards into the 1950s, these were racially uh, restrictive laws. And at the beginning of the Republic, only white people could naturalize. After the Civil War, white people and the descendants of people, uh, people of African descent could naturalize. And then in a famous set of cases from the late 1800s through the 19, uh, early 1900s into the 1950s, uh, naturalization was still racially restricted. That is, not everyone could become a citizen. Most famously, wow. uh, Asian uh, immigrants could not become citizens. Indian immigrants from the country of India could not become citizens. So There's a famous set of Supreme Court cases which um, which verified both of those things. Um, and this was contested. Uh, this was contested territory until the 1950s, on, after which federal immigration law uh, removed the racial restrictions on naturalization. But to go back to your question, yes, there were federal laws that uh, existing from the time of the creation of the Republic, which, uh, which detailed when people could naturalize. But the important thing, I think, to also add to your my answer here is that until the Civil War and until the 14th Amendment was added to the United States Constitution, Federal citizenship, citizen, United States citizenship, was not nearly as important as many historians will tell you than state citizenship. So to oh. to to become a citizen of a state may have meant more, may have had more consequences than to be a citizen of the United States. Well, I got to ask this. <laughs> Give me some examples, like how. I mean, Listen, I mean consequence, yeah. like in your practical everyday life. It was more important for me to be from, let's say, New York than to be of the United States. This is before the Civil War. Right. I mean, obviously, the, we're speaking in, in broad generalizations. Here, yeah. But uh, one way of understanding what happens after the Civil War and the Reconstruction uh, Amendments, especially the 14th Amendment, is that it fundamentally restructures the importance of membership in the federal government. Uh, that one could reasonably say that state laws and state regulation were the prime um, regulatory systems, the, fine, the, the prime legal systems that governed uh, everyday life for most people uh, at that time. And certainly this is one of the reasons why state laws regarding slavery up until the Civil War could exist, right? Because the yeah. federal government had no power to tell the state to to do something differently, right? And so, um, and this was a time before the Bill of Rights in the Fe in the federal constitution applied to the states. And so uh, states often had rules that were in variance with each other and with uh, the federal government with regards to um, rights that we now take as fundamental rights protected by the Bill of Rights. So this is a much- I'm sorry, our Bill of Rights did not apply to states before the Civil War? That is correct. Uh, wow. So the, until the 14th Amendment, and even after that, because it, it was a, a slower process of courts actually deciding which parts of the Bill of Rights applied against the states, the Bill of Rights was seen in the Constitution as only a prohibition against federal government action. In fact, you can see this in some of the wording, right? So when you look at the First Amendment, it says Congress shall not. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Um, and so... And so states might have had similar types of restrictions in their own state constitutions. But for example, if you were in a particular state and the state did something and you wanted to claim that the state was violating your freedom of, uh, of expression or your freedom of religion, you could not prior to the Civil War make a federal constitutional claim against Wow. The you would have to raise a claim underneath uh, a state constitutional provision or a state law provision. So- Going back to our discussion of immigration, we did rest of the Bill of Rights, but that was fascinating. Um, after 1875, uh, the federal government takes on a more robust uh, stance in regulating immigration. 
And in the minute we have left of this segment, uh, what I want to know is something that one of your colleagues, Dr. Um, Professor Jennifer Chacon, um, shared with me, um, the Dillingham Commission that came in the 1910s and 1920s. 1920s was famous, well, really infamous for immigration scares. Um, were, did states play a dominant role in that or was that mainly sort of a federal regulation matter? I'm so, I apologize that I'm not sure I understand the the quite when in when you when you're talking about that are you referring to the 1875 uh No, I'm government? going forward. No, thank you for clarifying that. I'm going forward to the 1920s mm -hmm. and prior to that 1910s where immigration became a huge political heated national issue. Mm -hmm. Uh what I want to know is that were states at that time enforcing their own local laws and regulations, or was by then the federal government now in control of immigration? Yeah, I now, think it's it's fair to say that by the 1920s, the federal government had become the prime, if not exclusive, regulator of, of immigration. And that's a story that really starts, as Professor Chacon uh, had uh, had mentioned on your podcast in 1875 with the first federal enactment, a, a law that that prohibited the immigration of uh, of of people who were likely to become public of of uh, sex workers uh, deemed prostitutes at that time, um, and and uh, another category of, uh, of of immigrants that's now escaping me right now is the first law and followed criminals. Yes, I, that's right, convicts. Yeah. And that, um, followed in short order uh, by the Chinese Exclusion Acts. And so by the time you get to the 1900s, um, early 1900s, it's, the court seems to have settled on the idea that at least with regards to admission, the terms and conditions of staying, and then exclusion, that is deportation, right, of kicking mm -hmm. people out, that the federal government is the prime, if not sole, regulator of that area. But by the time of the 1920s and the Dillingham Commission, there is a concern with the type of people that are being let in uh, under current federal immigration laws. In the late 1800s into the early 1900s, it is uh, at that point the United States experienced the highest number of foreign born uh, as a percentage of the United States population that the United States has ever faced, including up to today. Right. That oh, wow. As a percentage of the population. Um, and uh, at, during that time, the Industrial Revolution, the 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 place where people are coming from is changing. It's no longer predominantly northern and western Europe. It's starting to become southern and eastern European. Uh, and the uh, the people who had already been in the United States, the people in power in the United States, um, along with the eugenics movement, concerned about this new stock of immigrants coming. Uh, and this commission is constituted to, to study immigration law and comes to the conclusion that uh, the best way to handle this is to think about what the percentages of, of people were in the United States near the turn of the century and use that as the basis for future migration flows, thereby privileging Northern and Western European immigration uh, while um, diminishing uh, immigration from all other areas. And at this time, there are already laws that prohibit immigration from all over Asia. Uh, and so you get a very uh, constructed, racially constructed group of Americans coming in that time period. And these laws were mostly against um, Catholics, Orthodox Christians, and, and let's say Jews and, and Asians, uh, particularly Chinese. Um, yeah. At interesting. the federal level, is Chinese exclusion, um, and then and then you had uh, the 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 way the quotas worked. It essentially privileged uh, all all uh, immigration from northern and western Europe and diminished uh, immigration from places like Italy or Eastern Europe. I see. We'll be back after a short break to talk about the rest of this story that takes us into the twenty first century. 